You're listening to the St. John's Diamond Creek Podcast. This episode presented by Associate Minister Kirk McKenzie. Well, we're going to have our first Bible reading now, and it comes from Matthew chapter 27. The background to this Bible reading is that Jesus has been arrested by the chief priests and the elders. These are like the local religious authorities of his time, and he's been put on trial. It's a particularly dodgy trial that he's been put through. It's been held in the middle of the night. It's not an official sort of a uh, proper trial that you would expect to go through. He's had a whole bunch of false witnesses that have been brought against him. Uh, false testimony has been held against him, uh, but they've still found him, managed to find him guilty. And so uh, that trial is going to continue in a way, and you'll see he's been taken to the Roman governor to be uh, that trial to continue, uh, as was the way things were done back then. And so we're going to pick up the story uh, he's also been uh, betrayed by his friend Judas. Judas, one of the, his closest friends and disciples. Uh, and so the Bible reading, which Dan's going to bring to us now, uh, begins with uh, us looking at... Come on up, Dan. Uh, the Bible reading begins with Judas and his response to what's happened. Early in the morning, all the chief priests and the elders of the people made their plans how to have Jesus executed. So they bound him, led him away, and handed him over to Pilate, the governor. When Judas, who had betrayed him, saw that Jesus was condemned, he was seized with remorse and returned the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and the elders. I have sinned, he said, for I have betrayed innocent blood. What is that to us? They replied. That's your responsibility. So Judas threw the money into the temple court and left. Then he went away and hanged himself. The chief priests picked up the coins and said, it is against the law to put this into the treasury since it is blood money. So they decided to use the money to buy the potter's field as a burial place for foreigners. That is why it has been called the field of blood. To this day. Then what was spoken by Jeremiah the prophet was fulfilled. They took the 30 pieces of silver, the price set on him by the people of Israel, and they used them to buy the potter's field as the Lord commanded me. Meanwhile, Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? You have said so, Jesus replied. When he was accused by the chief priests and the elders, he gave no answer. Then Pilate asked him, Don't you hear the testimony they are bringing against you? But Jesus made no reply, not even to a single charge to the great amazement of the governor. Now it was the governor's custom at the festival to to release a prisoner chosen by the crowd. At that time, they had a well-known prisoner whose name was Jesus Barabbas. So when the crowd had gathered, Pilate asked them, which one do you want me to release to you? Jesus Barabbas? Or Jesus, who is called the Messiah. For he knew it was out of self-interest that they had handed Jesus over to him. 
While Pilate was sitting on the judge's seat, his wife sent him this message. Don't have anything to do with that innocent man, for I have suffered a great deal today in a dream because of him. But the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas and to have Jesus executed. Which of the two do you want me to release to you? asked the governor. Barabbas, they answered. What shall I do then with Jesus, who is called the Messiah? Pilate asked. They all answered, Crucify him! Why? What crime has he committed? asked Pilate. But they shouted all the louder, Crucify him! When Pilate saw that he was getting nowhere, but that instead an uproar was starting, he took water and washed his hands in front of the crowd. I am innocent of this man's blood, he said. It is your responsibility. All the people answered, his blood is on us and on our children. Then he released Barabbas to them, but he had Jesus flogged and handed him over to be crucified. Then the governor's soldiers took Jesus into the praetorium and gathered the whole company of soldiers around him. They stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him and then twisted together a crown of thorns and set it on his head. They put a staff in his right hand. Then they knelt in front of him and mocked him. Hail, King of the Jews, they said. They spit on him and took the staff and struck him on the head again and again. After they had mocked him, they took off the robe and put his own clothes on him. Then they led him away to crucify him. Thank you, Jan. Uh, excellent Bible reading. And what it does is it shows the intensity of the situation that Jesus is in. Uh, not just for Jesus, but for his friends, for his disciples, and, and even just for the community that Jesus was living in, the general society that he was a part of. It seems like it was a time of great upheaval, uh, great amount of disruption and chaos that was going on in Jesus' time. And as I've been reading this story uh, a number of times in the last couple of weeks and you know, preparing for today, I couldn't help but think about some of the things that have been happening over the last two and a half years during the pandemic and the times of upheaval and chaos we've been seeing in our own world. And I want to talk about that for a few minutes now. Now, I realise when we do this, there's a risk in making too close a comparison, you know, and saying like, oh, what we've been going through the last two and a half years is exactly like they were going through, you know, 2,000 years ago in Jesus' time. And of course, it's not exactly the same. Uh, there are some differences. But what I am saying is that even though a lot has changed, you know, technology has progressed a long way, we've become part of a much more globalised culture, uh, the human experience hasn't changed that much and the human heart hasn't changed that much. And so if you yourself have been perhaps thinking about the story of Jesus' crucifixion this week uh, or over the period of Lent even and thinking, gee, there's some similarities to what we've been experiencing as a world over the last couple of years. Uh, that, that's, that makes sense. Uh, and having those connections makes sense. For example, let's think about injustice. There was, there's been a lot of injustice exposed during the pandemic. This sort of stuff tends to happen when, it, when intense situations happen, usually injustice, which has maybe been just sort of under the surface and not really out in the open, it tends to get exposed. And a lot of that seems to have happened during the pandemic. Uh, and what I, I've really noticed and struck me is that the poor and the powerless 
seem to pay the biggest price during the pandemic. And often the rich and the powerful seem to profit. Uh, you know, the JobKeeper scheme that we had in Australia uh, was, was meant to help people keep their jobs, and thankfully for a lot of people, including in our church, it did help some people keep their jobs, not everyone, but it was also exploited and rorted by a bunch of companies who managed to give massive payouts to their executives uh, and with seemingly no accountability for that. There was some horrendous treatment by bosses towards their employees. There was some horrendous treatment of tenants by their landlords during the pandemic. You know, early on, it seemed like, oh, well, maybe this will be good because it's sort of getting, all this stuff is getting exposed and maybe there'll be some justice in response to this injustice because we were seeing it a lot more as getting reported. But it seemed like as the pandemic rolled on and there was issue after issue after issue, the pandemic just sort of covered up the injustice. And, you know, we just rolled on to the next thing and we forgot about all these things that were happening to the poor and the weakest people in our society. So injustice continues to be a theme in our world. It doesn't seem to be going away. And it was definitely an issue in the Good Friday story because we have Barabbas, a convicted terrorist, being set free and Jesus, an innocent man, being punished and sent to be executed. You know, you've got Jesus standing there in front of the governor, in front of the crowd. He's innocent. And we've got this angry, corrupt crowd, you know, bellowing for a guilty man to be set free. This is the image of our first Bible reading today. And it's interesting Jesus' response, actually, uh, and the way he responds. You know, I mentioned earlier he'd had... He'd already had a trial in Matthew chapter 26, which we haven't read this morning. The way it worked back then was they had a local trial amongst the Jewish people, and so that was with the chief priests and the elders. And then because the Romans had conquered the Jewish people, they had to then go to the Roman governor, whose name is Pilate, in this particular situation, and he had to give it the tick of approval, because the Romans were the boss, right? So they'd actually have to say, yes, your local trial is correct, and so the Romans would sort of follow through on it. Or say, no, we disagree, and change the verdict. So chapter 27 is like part two of the trial, where the Roman governor's checking on things. And so in verse 12, we read this. When Jesus was accused by the chief priests and the elders, he gave no answer. Then Pilate asked him, so this is the Roman governor, don't you hear the testimony they are bringing against you? But Jesus made no reply, not even to a single charge to the great amazement of the governor. It's like at this point, Jesus is just sick of all the false accusations. He's sick of the lies. He's sick of the, the misinformation. I mean, Phil, that could have been word of the year the last couple of years in our society. Like he's just, he's sick of it all. It's like, I'm not going to dignify all this charade with a response. I'm just going to stand and be silent here. And he doesn't talk much during this trial with Pilate, actually. He gives a few responses, but to the accusations that are being brought against him by the chief priests and the elders, he says nothing. And so Pilate actually finds Jesus innocent. He doesn't think Jesus has done anything wrong. But he sentences him to death anyway. He thinks one thing but does another. And we go, well, how does he deal with this contradiction? How does he deal with this hypocrisy? And that answer comes in verse 24 where it says this, when Pilate saw that he was getting nowhere but that instead an uproar was starting, he took water and washed his hands in front of the crowd I am innocent of this man's blood, he said. It is your responsibility. It's not my responsibility. It's yours. It's the crowd's fault that Jesus is getting executed, not mine. Now, it is his responsibility. He's the governor. Like, it's literally his responsibility to take care of this. It's his decision. 
but he's deflecting responsibility for this decision onto the crowd. Now, we see this happen earlier as well, right? In, in verse 4, when Judas is regretting his decision to betray Jesus, and he said, I've done the wrong thing. In verse 4, he goes back to the chief priests and the elders. He says, I have sinned. I have betrayed innocent blood. What do, how do they respond? What is that to us? That's your responsibility. They're the ones who got him to do it. They're the ones who paid him to do it. And yet, it's not nothing to do with us. That's on you. And so what we see in this story is people who have power deflecting their responsibility for their actions, not owning up to the things that they're doing. Now, of course, we all do this, right, from preps through to politicians, from kids blaming each other in the schoolyards through to the world leaders deflecting responsibility for the things they've stuffed up. And for me, it's been a big theme in my life where I've gone, you know, if I've been in disagreement with someone or some people, I've actually spent the time afterwards in my own head, sometimes for hours, sometimes even for days, just running it through in my head, working out why it was their fault. You know, just why they should have done things better, what, how they could have responded better, why I was innocent, why I handled the situation best. Maybe every now and then I'd admit I didn't handle it perfectly, but they were way worse. Like, they should have done so much better. And and that was how I operated for, for a long time. And it wasn't until I started following Jesus seriously that I started to seriously consider that maybe sometimes I'm a big contributor to the problem. And shocking horror, maybe sometimes I am the problem. Like that was my fault. <laughs> I was the problem there. And I was the source of all the issues. And so what we have in this situation is we look at this beginning of Matthew chapter 27, and we're going to continue the rest of the story soon, is there's sin everywhere. Sin is when we do wrong or we fail to do right, when we don't walk in God's ways. And no one's taking responsibility for it. People are deflecting responsibility. The crowd says that they're taking responsibility. They shout, we'll do it, we'll take responsibility and we'll put, put his blood on us and on our children. But they're just, they're just taken along with the moment. Just an angry mob just getting taken away with it. And what are they taking responsibility for? Killing an innocent person. It's hardly admirable behaviour. So there's sin all over the place in this story. It's chaotic. There's no justice going on. No one wants to take proper responsibility. Thankfully, Jesus is about to take responsibility for all of it. Hi, I'm Ella. Let's continue the story in Matthew. As they were going out, they met a man from the Cyrene named Simon, and they forced him to carry the cross. They came to a place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. There they offered Jesus wine to drink, mixed with gall. But after tasting it, he refused to drink it. When they had crucified him, they divided up his clothes by casting lots and sitting down, they kept watch over him there. Af above his head, they placed the written charge against him. This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Two rebels were crucified with him, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, you who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. Come down from the cross if you were the son of God. In the same way, the chief priests, the teachers of the law and the elders mocked him. He saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. He's the king of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross and, and we'll believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God rescue him now if he wants him. 
For he said, I am the Son of God. In the same way, the rebels who were crucified with him also heaped insults on him. From noon until three in the afternoon, darkness came over all the land. About three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing there heard this, they said, he's calling Elijah. Immediately, one of them ran and got a sponge. He filled it with wine vinegar and put on a staff and offered it to Jesus to drink. The rest said, now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to save him. And when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. At that moment, the temple, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook, the rocks split and the tombs broke open. The bodies of the holy people who had died were raised to life. They came out of the tombs after Jesus' resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared to many people. When the centurion and those who were with him were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and all that had happened, they were terrified and exclaimed, surely he was the son of God. Many women were there watching from a distance. They had followed Jesus from Galilee to care for his needs. Among them were Mary Magdalene, Mary the the mother of James and Joseph, and the mother of Zebedee's sons. I mentioned before, Jesus is taking responsibility for sin as he heads to the cross. Now, to be clear, he's not taking responsibility in the sense of saying, oh, guys, it's my fault. You know, I I did it, all all this stuff, you know, you know, I, it's, it's my responsibility. Um, you, you know, I caused all this. You know, I made you all do it. Now, he's taking responsibility in the sense he's going to deal with it. He's going to make a way through all this, this problem of sin. So let's have a think about how he does that and from a couple of different angles. Uh, let's think about it from the point of view of an individual to start with. Uh, for, for us as individuals... Uh, Sin really messes with our relationships, and in particular, with our ability to have a relationship with God. Sin is the major reason why we doubt that God exists, or that if he does exist, that he is good. Uh, And so it's like it it creates a barrier between us and God. In an ideal world where sin doesn't exist, we would just be able to know God is good all the time and be in perfect relationship with him. There'd be no problems. But because of sin... Uh, That's not the case, and it's not as simple as that. And so what we need is for someone who's not us, we're not strong enough to do this, to come and deal with sin and to remove that barrier that sometimes blocks us from being in good relationship with God. And So what Jesus does on the cross is he takes our sin upon himself. And he can do that because he's not just a normal person, he's also God. Uh, he's God come to earth uh, as a human being. And so he, t- he takes our sin onto himself. And when he dies on the cross, he kills our sin. He destroys it. He removes it as a barrier for everyone who puts their trust in him, for everyone who believes in Jesus. So we're then free to have a relationship with God. We can experience forgiveness for our sins. We're not guilty of sin when we put our trust in Jesus. We don't need to feel guilty for our sins. We can experience freedom and we can experience a loving relationship with God because of what Jesus has done. This is a wonderful thing. It lies really at the heart of the Christian experience. Uh, We often say that uh, having a relationship with God is the best thing that you can have in life. Uh, And it's because of what Jesus has done that that's available to everyone, including everyone here today 
and everyone watching at home. But of course, sin's not just an individual problem, is it? It's also a group problem. It's a problem for families. It's a problem for communities. It's a problem for the world. And so Jesus deals with sin on that level as well. We have quite a profound image of that in our passage today. It comes in verse 37. Above his head, they placed a written charge against him. This is like a sign that they probably nailed to the top of the cross above his head. And on that cross it says, this is Jesus, the king of the Jews. Now this would have been put there by the Romans, not because they believed it, it's not a statement that they thought was true, it's to mock Jesus, it's to tease Jesus and to, to make fun of the Jews. It's like, oh, look at this king of the Jews. Well, we've just tortured him and now we're about to kill him. So make them feel small because the Romans have conquered the Jews and they want them to know what their, where their place is in the hierarchy of power. And yet, it's an ironically true sign. Jesus was the king of the Jews. Jesus is the king of the world. Actually, people had tried to make Jesus king multiple times. Uh, he, because of his great teaching, because of his incredible miracles that he'd been doing, because he was just very popular. But they wanted him to be the type of king that Jesus was not. They wanted him to be a conquering king, someone who was going to come in and overthrow the Romans, to be that sort of, you know, revolutionary sort of king, uh, you know, going to make Israel great again, That's that kind of guy. And that was just not the type of uh, king that Jesus was going to be. In fact, earlier in uh, chapter 26, uh, when the soldiers come to arrest Jesus, the, uh, Peter, one of Jesus' friends, pulls out a sword to fight them off. And Jesus says, no, put that sword away. That's not the way I roll. This is not the way things are going to go. If I wanted to, because he's God, I could get a whole army of angels here just to blow these guys away. But that's not how it's going to be. He was committed to the human experience all the way until death. And he wasn't the type of king who was going to use his divine power just to smash all his opposition. He's going to do things in a very different way. You see, Jesus is the type of king who, in being God, then becomes one of us and joins us in the messiness and the chaos of human life. And when he was a human being, you know, living amongst us, he wasn't, one who, he wasn't the type of king who lived at a distance, you know, in a palace or a throne room, whatever. He lived with normal, everyday people. He spent time with the poorest people. He's the type of king who has a deep connection, a deep personal connection with his people. He's the type of king who lays down his life for his people. And so, when we have a relationship with Jesus, with God through Jesus, what we are given is a new way to live. And that's a a way of living where we follow in the ways of the servant king, where we uh, challenge injustice, where we use the power that we have in our life to serve, not to pump ourselves up and make ourselves big where we take responsibility when we've done the wrong thing. We take responsibility for our own failures and we turn away from sin when we see that it's in our own lives. Because we are loved completely and because we're forgiven, we don't need to deflect responsibility for our sin. We can own up to it. We don't need to be ducking for cover going, oh, I feel guilty. I'm going to have to cover it up. I'm going to have to push it onto other people because we know we're forgiven. We can take full responsibility because we know we've got someone who loves us completely. We've got someone who's made that ultimate sacrifice for us. We can fight against injustice. We can give up our power in order to serve others. And so... Jesus' ultimate resurrection points us to a time where sin and injustice are going to be a complete non-issue 
But in the meantime, he calls each of us to be part of a movement where we follow in the ways of the servant king, knowing that we're loved completely and living in these ways, taking responsibility for our sin, turning away from it with his help and fighting against things like chaos and injustice. And so what I want to do today is to challenge us to acknowledge our sin. Let's not be like Pilate in this chapter. Let's not be like the chief priests and the elders who deflected responsibility for their failures onto others. Let's be honest with ourselves and realise that no one here, myself included, absolutely, is perfect. That each of us has done wrong and failed to do right. Now, we don't do this so that we can all feel guilty, like, oh, we're all the worst. We do this knowing that Jesus has made that ultimate sacrifice, showing us that we are loved completely by God and that we receive forgiveness through the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. And so the second part of the challenge, as well as acknowledging our sin, is to believe in Jesus, to believe in the servant king who died for us and forgives our sin. And so now uh, is the time for us to get our scrunched up piece of paper out because we've just put together a very simple little response activity uh, that we hope will be helpful today and perhaps might be something that you could use uh, throughout the week as well or, or going forward. So uh, you're welcome to open up this piece of paper. Now this activity is going to finish with a confession prayer. So I'm going to put the words of that prayer on the screen right now. Um, now, if you're watching at home, uh, what I encourage you to do is to write the words of the first two lines of this prayer on the piece of paper, because the people who are opening up the prayer, uh, you're opening up the paper, actually have that already pre-written on their paper, but we couldn't organise for that to happen at home. <laughs> uh, so, um, encourage you to write that now, just the first two lines, which are, Oh God, you have searched us out and known us, and all that we are is open to you. But I encourage you to just take a moment to read through that prayer, because we're going to finish with that prayer uh, at the end of the activity. So just have a look at that for a moment. Now, why the paper? And why did we scrunch it up? Well, let's think about it this way. When we present ourselves to other people, we tend to present a version of ourselves that, it, you know, smooths out some of the wrinkles. You know what I mean? Like, I present a version of myself to you that is better than the real me, <laughs> right? I hide some of the worst bits of me. There's bits about me, particularly things that I've thought that I just prefer you don't know, <laughs> right? So, and that's what we do. That's okay. That's okay. That makes sense. Um, you know, you don't have to introduce yourself to someone first time you ever meet them and go, now, here's all the terrible things I've ever thought, said and done. Uh, that, that would be a weird way to live. Um, but with God, he knows everything. Right? He's all-powerful. He's all-knowing. He knows everything we've thought. He knows everything we've done. He knows everything we've said. And so there's no point hiding from God. There's no point pretending. There's no point deflecting responsibility when it comes to talking with God, presenting ourselves to God. And so as much as we might present you know, a version of ourselves that hides some of the crinkles to each other, when it comes to presenting ourselves to God, what I want to encourage us to do is to present the full version of ourselves, every crinkle, every wrinkle, every stuff up to him. Now, there are some wonderful things about you. There are some brilliant things about the people sitting next to you. There's some awesome things about everyone watching at home. God has made you very good, but we all sin. And so let's complete, present the complete picture to God this morning. And so when we pray this confession prayer together, we want to be doing both a confession of our sins and an embracing of the forgiveness and the love that Jesus gives to us. We don't want to just stop at saying, oh, I'm bad, and leave it at that. We want to welcome God's love 
and an invitation to be made whole and to be set free. So we hope that as we look at this, um, you know, this crinkled bit of paper, that will help us to have a really realistic view of ourselves and then point us towards a God who knows us completely and loves us completely. So we hope it will be helpful this morning and maybe something you could take home with you and use as you pray throughout the week. So I'm going to put the words of the prayer back up on the screen. Uh, And if you believe in Jesus, then I encourage you to join in in the yellow. Uh, And if you're here today and, you know, this is really new to you and, you know, you're sort of coming to church today and thinking maybe you weren't a believer in Jesus, you're right at the start of that journey, but you'd like to take your first step in a relationship with Jesus, then joining in in this prayer could be your first step. Uh, in that relationship. So you'd be most welcome to join in in that way. So let's pray. Oh God, you have searched us out and known us and all that we are is open to you. We confess that we have sinned. We've used our power to dominate and our weakness to manipulate. We have evaded responsibility and failed to confront evil. We've denied dignity to ourselves and to each other and fallen into despair. We turn to you, O God. We renounce evil. We claim your love. We choose to be made whole. And most importantly, Because of Jesus, your sins are forgiven. Be at peace. Hi, my name is Mark. Let's conclude our reading from Matthew chapter 27. As evening approached, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph who had himself become a disciple of Jesus. Going to Pilate, he asked for Jesus' body, and Pilate ordered that it be given to him. Joseph took the body, wrapped it in his clean linen cloth, and placed it in his own new tomb that he'd cut cut out from the rock. He rolled a big stone in front of the entrance to the tomb and went away. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary were sitting there opposite the tomb. The next day, the one after preparation day, the chief priests and the Pharisees went to Pilate. Sir, they said, we remember that while he was still alive, the deceiver said, after three days, I will rise again. So give the order for the tomb to be made secure until the third day. Otherwise, his disciples may come and steal the body and tell the people that he'd been raised from the dead. The last deception will be worse than the first. Take a guard, Pilate answered. Go, make the tomb as secure as you know how. So they went and made the tomb secure by putting a seal on the stone and posting the guard. Well, we can see that there was a rumour going round that Jesus would rise again. And Jesus' enemies, I guess the people who had organised for him to be executed, they'd heard it and they they didn't believe it, but they were concerned that Jesus' disciples were going to you know, create this whole scheme and steal the body and sort of pretend that it happened. So what are Jesus' disciples thinking at this point? Their friend has been killed, he's been buried. They've heard Jesus talking about rising again. But, you know, Jesus spoke symbolically sometimes, didn't he? He spoke in metaphor. He taught in parables. So what what did he really mean? Uh, was it literally three days? Did he mean he was literally going to come back to life? In what way? Uh, was Jesus telling the truth? You know, they would have had some doubts. Uh, and, of course, they had the other problem where 
Jesus' followers were being hunted by the authorities as well. So they were sort of in hiding and, and watching out for themselves. So it was this very tricky time to be a follower of Jesus, hoping that this idea of the resurrection was true, but not really knowing exactly if it was and how that would work. And we have the benefit of knowing that Jesus did rise from the dead, and that's what we celebrate on Easter Sunday. So we'd like to extend the invitation to you to come back on Easter Sunday and join us. We have in-person services here at 8 a.m. and at 10 a.m. and at 6 p.m. And the 10 a.m. and the 6 p.m. will be live streamed on YouTube as well. So we'd love to see you there as we remember the resurrection and celebrate it. Uh, A couple of other things we would recommend for you if you'd like to continue uh, discovering more about Jesus and all that he achieved. Uh, on our, uh, If you're in person, on the table out there in the foyer, we have copies of what we call the Gospels or the biographies of Jesus. They're named after the authors, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. Uh, and so they're for free. So if you don't have a Bible at home or maybe you've got one that's got, got a quite confusing old English translation and you'd like one that's a bit easier to read, Uh, then take one of these uh, and feel free to take an extra one to give to a friend who you think might like to read one. They're for uh, for you for free today. If you're watching at home, obviously you can't get one of those, but we have links in our YouTube description uh, to websites that have the Bible free to read in different languages, in different translations, as well as audio versions of the Bible. So do check those out. Another thing we'd love to recommend to you, uh, particularly if you're really new to Christianity, if you're investigating it, uh, and if you'd loved an opportunity to have a safe place where you can have a respectable conversation where you can ask questions about what Christians believe, about the meaning of life, about the existence of God, what Jesus was on about, uh, where you can disagree with people about the things that we've talked about today uh, and debate things, then we're running an Alpha course starting on May 1st, and Alpha is all about providing that opportunity. Uh, It's going to be at lunch times on a Sunday, Uh, We've got flyers for those, again, available on the two uh, tables just in the foyer there. And there's a section for Alpha on our website, which should be reasonably easy to find. Uh, So we'd love you to check that out. Uh, Alpha runs over a number of weeks, but you're welcome to come along the first one or two weeks and check it out to see if you'd like to continue on with it. Um, And so I'm actually going to get Joel. Can you just just come up the front? Uh, Because Joel's Joel's our um, Associate Minister. I'm just going to give you a look at him. Here he is. Uh, So if you're in person today, uh, have a chat with Joel about it because uh, he'd love to talk to you about Alpha today. Um, So you you need to stand in front of the camera. So if you're coming on Sunday, there he is, right? Uh, So that um, you you can meet Joel and find out more about the course. We'd love to see you there. If you'd like to know more, have a chat to us today and come and check out the Alpha course. Uh, I did the, the Alpha course many years ago and it really helped me to get to know all about what Jesus is all about. We're going to finish our service today by singing the song, Man of Sorrows. This is a song that reflects on all that Jesus did on the cross and looks forward to the resurrection of Jesus. Thanks for joining us. If you'd like to subscribe to this podcast, you can do so in Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts from. Just search for St. John's Diamond Creek.